and innovator in financial consumer protection and is well positioned to take on this new responsibility. Working closely with the Department of Finance to advance a consumer-driven banking framework, which prioritizes innovation and includes strong and consistent protections for Canadians who will use consumer-driven banking. The new framework is guided by three objectives, safety and soundness, protecting the financial well-being of Canadians, and advancing economic growth and international competitiveness. While the Department of Finance leads on policy and legislative and regulatory development for this framework, Budget 2024 proposes to provide $1 million in 2024-25 to FCAC to support preparation for its new responsibilities. This funding in the budget will also allow us to prepare for a consumer awareness campaign. Over the coming months, we will support the Department of Finance in its engagement with the financial sector and other stakeholders on the development of the remaining elements of the consumer-driven banking framework. FCAC has deep knowledge of how the banking industry in Canada functions through our work as an industry regulator. Consumer-driven banking complements existing financial services. FCAC's suitability for oversight of consumer-driven banking extends also from our knowledge of consumer trends and issues and our long-standing consumer education mandate. We conduct research to better understand consumer needs and behavior, including how financial decisions are made. We also collaborate with organizations across the financial ecosystem, including financial service providers, consumer advocacy groups, and provincial and territorial regulators. These factors position the agency to effectively protect consumers while overseeing an innovative and competitive framework that benefits all parties. Budget 2024 also includes other initiatives to benefit and protect consumers, such as a low-cost, no-cost bank account commitment originally announced in 2014. FCAC is working with banks to update this commitment to expand the features of low-cost accounts to reflect modern banking and expand the accessibility of no-cost accounts to more Canadians. Our work to update the commitment is another example of how our understanding of consumer needs complements our regulatory mandate. I will end there. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, Mr. Litke. And uh, there, I'm sure there will be many questions. We're now going to hear from the University of Ottawa and Professor Al Jacobs. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Good morning. Today, I will discuss the Impact Assessment Act and the need for addressing transporter government initiatives. I can answer questions in English or French. With everything that Ms. Yetman said, uh, that's, the, that's the end of my expertise on that subject matter. Um, I, I do have a little bit of expertise, though, on the environment and the Constitution. Um, I teach it, I research it, and um, on the side, I've, I've litigated all the major cases in the Supreme Court of Canada since 1990 on the issue, except for the last one, where the court struck down the Impact Assessment Act. We were in France that year. Um, I've also been involved in the development of every environmental impact assessment bill since 1992, and I'm proud to say that the first one was introduced by the Conservatives, and it's enjoyed support by all parties in the House ever since then for the last 20 or 30 plus years. Um, so for today, I'm going to focus on the, the changes that were brought in to address the Supreme Court's decision. That's the purpose of the revisions in this bill. Um, and the court, you've got slides for me, by the way, so if you don't like what I'm saying, there's um, a small slide deck in en anglais, en français, uh, and you can follow along. Um, the court really did two major things. I'm only going to talk about one of them. The first thing they talked about was distinguishing between federal projects and provincial projects. The Act more or less has that right. But the second thing the court said is making sure that assessments involve only effects within federal jurisdiction. That's the defined term in the Act. Um, the court said that the definition was a little bit too broad and needed to be tightened up. In particular, the court said that the federal government does not have jurisdiction over all aspects of cross-border environmental harm, such as greenhouse gas emissions. It doesn't have comprehensive authority over everything. It focused by saying that the Act should limit itself to things that cause significant effects within federal jurisdiction for cross-border impacts. So. If you look at the slides, or you can look at it later, what I've done is I've set out how this Act defines effects in federal jurisdiction and compared it with the previous bill, which was the way the Harper government defined it in 2012, and 
we may find it surprising that the Harper government defined it more broadly. Um, so in addition to fish and federal lands and migratory birds, which everyone agrees on, the previous version said all cross-border pollution, everything that crosses a provincial or national border is a federal matter, which intuitively makes sense. This bill has narrowed that just to cross-border water pollution and marine pollution, just those two. Uh, and it's gone far further than the court required by doing that. Um, in effect, it's abandoned long-standing federal authority over cross-border environmental effects, except in, in regard to water. Uh, and as you will know, a core responsibility of the federal government is to deal with pollution problems that don't respect borders, that affect other provinces and other countries. Uh, if they didn't have that, it would undermine the ability of provinces to protect their own environment from upstream or upwind pollution. Um, I won't get into a, a, an in-depth lecture on constitutional law in two minutes and 30 seconds, but let me just say this, that there is clear constitutional authority recognized by the Supreme Court to address international and cross-border environmental effects. The Supreme Court of Canada in 1997, in upholding the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, said the federal government can regulate pollution that causes serious harm and moves across provincial or international borders. And then in upholding the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act in 2021, the court again said, parliament may regulate over serious extra provincial harm to the environment. In fact, Canada has, been, uh, has signed a treaty more than 30 years ago legally requiring it to do environmental assessment of any activity that may cause significant transboundary environmental harm. That's a treaty obligation and an international law obligation. It's, when I read the amendments, I was surprised to say that the, the act would cover cross-border water pollution but not cross-border air pollution. It seemed a little bit absurd, to be honest. Uh, Parliament has been legislating over cross-border air pollution since 1971. Um, it's been reg regulating over greenhouse gases since 2010. Those regulations were brought in by the Harper government, and then again in 2012. So um, they've been operating in this area for over 30 years, uh, and it seems like, I, I can't explain why um, such a cautious approach was taken, but it really leaves the government of Canada unable to deal with a problem that can only be addressed at a federal level, which is pollution problems that move across national or provincial borders. And if, if you need any convincing, in the last slide I've just given you some quick summaries of why cross-border air pollution is a big deal. So there are 15,300 pr premature deaths each year in Canada from air pollution. Economic cost of $114 billion. So that's it. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Professor LG, and I'm sure there'll be many questions, and we're going to start with those right now. So the first round, each party will have up to six minutes to ask uh, the witnesses questions. We're starting with MP Williams for the first six minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning to everyone in Ottawa. Mr. Leckie, I'm going to start with you, sir, if I can, and we're going to talk about Open banking. Canadians are, have been waited with uh, bated breath to see legislation for open banking. They're, they want to see uh, open banking implemented and, and, this, and alongside it, uh, instant payments. And we have, we have some reports that say the delay from CE, CEBR says the delay from instant payments is costing the GDP up to 2.7% a year. Uh, and that would be almost $500 million or just a little bit more than that. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the government's conversations with you and, and congratulations on being named the regulator. What is the timeline the government is giving you, uh, the clear timeline for implementation of open banking in Canada, or have they given you one yet? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, we don't have a full timeline at this time. What we are looking at is the legislation asked us to commence the preparation of our regulatory activities, which we're in the process of doing, and that's what we'll use the million dollars in the budget to do. Um, and we're supporting the Department of Finance uh, from a policy perspective and a research perspective as they continue the development of the legislation, which will include those full timelines. So just to give everyone at home a little bit clear lens, uh, you've always been uh, more involved with consumer regulation. You'll be doing the same consumer regulation. Uh, something open banking, uh, consumer-led banking is going to implement as well, though, is B2B, so business to business. So how do you intend to look at business to business to shift gears, uh, not just from the consumer itself, and 
what are you specifically looking at to take care of also those concerns from businesses? Yes, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Um, so we actually see the business to business being a nexus to the financial consumer as well, because one of the benefits of consumer driven banking is that the consumers will have a safe and secure way to have their data transferred. So as the businesses, as we create a framework that allows the business to business to share the data, they'll become accredited that by default, by addressing their issues, we will be protecting financial consumers at the same time. So to answer your specific details of how we're going to engage the business to business, that's still to be developed as the next part of the framework. How long do you see that implementation? Will you have um, any, any consultations with business groups? So there's gonna be any, is there gonna be consultations at all from the business side? Chairs. So the, the next phase is to continue with the, the elements of identifying the accreditation standards, the liability issues, the privacy and the security issues. So we will be supporting the Department of Finance in these consultations with industries and, and applicable stakeholders. Do you support amendments that allow us to look at business to business as, as part of what the regulation should look like? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Um, it's too early in that stage. We, I need to see the, uh, the rest of the legislation of how that will impact. So I, I don't have, have uh, insight into what that will be to give you, uh, give you an opinion on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, speaking of, uh, of it being early right now, um, we've, we've started to see the implementation of administrative monetary penalties, so AMPS, uh, when the bill with maximum penalties of up to 10 million for violations by registered entities. Uh, that's more than some fintechs have in total revenue for a year. Um, so wondering why we have these AMPs uh, introduced prior to legislation being introduced by the government. Would you support that perhaps we should see these AMPs removed until the legislation is presented? For the question, Mr. Chair. Um, my understanding is it's uh, there's a large part of the AMP section is just to have penalties which are very similar to the Bank Act. So especially with companies that are misrepresenting themselves. Uh, so I think there is an advantage to protect financial consumers by having these uh, potential penalties at the outset to ensure that there's proper behavior. And are you aware that some of these AMPs are larger than those AMPs for FinTech? So, so or sorry, for not for FinTech, for uh, FinTrack. So some, some companies that actually perform fraud, that these are higher penalties? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Um, so I wasn't aware of that, but certainly Department of Finance has, uh, would have done their studies to determine the appropriateness of the AMPs. Given that uh, in, your, in your opening round, you said uh, that FCFC is playing such an important part and, and we agree that we need regulation, we need to get open banking going, but was $1 million allocated to your organization really, uh, really testament to playing such an important part and in, in, in this regulation, this first phase of study, and just to compare um, the UK's open banking invitation entity, which is OBIIE, was established and they were funded with 60 billion pounds uh, to start the same phase. Do you think that only being provided 1 million is enough? The million dollars that we're receiving is just for the remaining of this fiscal year in order to do the preparatory work that we're gonna do between now and the end of March. We will go back to government in the fall to put in a full funding request to what we will need for our structure, our consumer awareness campaign, and what the cost will be to sustain this operation. So the million dollars is just for the next uh, nine or 10 months or so. And do you see uh, there has been reports and, and this government keeps promising the industry that they will have legislation uh, implemented as soon as they can. They keep kicking it down the line. Do you see this legislation coming in fall 2024? Question, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't have insight into the full legislative calendar. That would be under the responsibility of the Department of Finance. Hey, Mr. Chair, Chair, do I have any Williams? time left? Yep, yeah, that's yeah, that's the time. But thank you. Thank you. And now to uh, MP Thompson for the next six minutes. Thank you. And welcome to the witnesses. I, I need to start with you, Ms. Yetman, um, and um, thank you for your comments. It's really nice to. Uh, hear the positive, um, and I quite agree with you that the attention on um, uh, teachers uh, was incredibly important. Um, but I, I thank you again for the um, the link um, 
to food secure insecurity and the importance of the school lunch program. And one of the things I know in, in my province in conversations that I'm having um, within the community and, um, and, and there is tremendous support for this is the need to ensure that we have a cultural lens on how we present the program so that the rural communities um, are very much part of this program and we don't just end up in, in urban, which is clearly where we've had more strength in programs in the past, but it really is about every child. So um, I look forward to uh, to working through that going forward. Um, but, but certainly, you know, as a mother, even though my children are outside of the school system now, but, you know, the, the shortages for nurse, or nurses, I know that one better, but shortages for, you know, the same thing. For teachers, it, it's been, it, you know, it, it's been um, coming for quite a period of time. There, there's, um, there's no doubt that rural communities see this more intensely than urban areas. And the pandemic and the challenges of switching to remote learning, though I do think, um, what happened was phenomenal and how educators stepped up and really you know, did so much to try to continue to uh, ensure that children move forward in their education. But we saw a significant number of senior educators leave, which is just exacerbated the, uh, the problem. And, and again, to your point, the loan forgiveness, I think, is a really helpful way to encourage young educators to move to rural areas and really begin to address the challenge. Um, would you comment on that and what you're hearing from, from teachers across the country and, and certainly uh, you know, any additional comments you have on this and what we need to do moving forward to ensure that um, we really mitigate the shortage as much as we possibly can in the short term and build strengths in going forward so we don't end up in this place again? Well, as you know, um, education is a provincial uh, jurisdiction. And uh, one of the things that has been happening over the last uh, 10, 20 years is systemic underfunding of education, unfortunately. And that systemic underfunding has created, um, like I said in my opening statement, uh, less resources for students and uh, much more difficult working conditions. Um, if we look uh, to the north, I, I was really lucky. I got to visit Nunavut this year to talk to the teachers up there. And um, teachers in the south, if you would like to call that uh, the south, when there were no jobs in the south, they would move up to the north. And some of them stayed because the north is quite an interesting place to work and an interesting place to live, depending on the, like the Yukon Northwest Territories also. Uh, but now, uh, not as many people are going up north. And the reason is, and you just have to look across the country, in the fall of 2023, Quebec announced 8,500 teachers missing in the system. In Ontario, for example, there are about 37,000 teachers that are part of the College of Teachers, but they're not in classrooms. Where have they gone? During the pandemic, as you said, teachers realized they could do other things. So they started uh, exploring other job opportunities that were per perhaps less stressful, didn't have to bring as much work home on the weekends and the evenings, etc. So we are seeing a retention and recruitment crisis across Canada, and it's going to get worse because retirements are going to start going up. And so that's why the loan forgiveness for the North is really important. If we want to attract teachers to the North, it's no longer what it was before where there were no jobs and let's go to the North and see. Uh, you know, I met teachers up there from uh, Newfoundland, New Brunswick, that have stayed their entire career up there. They went there as a young teacher because there were no jobs in the South and they stayed up there. Um, so it's a really important little piece. We also, I know that loan forgiveness are, is already there for nurses and doctors for that same reason, for remote communities and rural communities, uh, to kind of gravitate those people into those, into those areas. So yeah, unfortunately, education in this country is going through uh, a bit of a crisis right now. And so these three things that I talked about, mental health, loan forgiveness, and the universal school food program are all going to be very helpful. Um, even just speaking about um, the universal school, school program, we know that classrooms are becoming more and more violent, unfortunately. 
And believe it or not, it's the little ones in kindergarten and grade one who lost two years of socialization. And uh, there was research in Toronto that showed that a food program actually brought down violence in, the, in schools. So I think this is gonna be good for classroom complexity as well. I could go on. I like to talk, but no, no, and, that, and that's, <laughs> and that's wonderful. And um, uh, it's funny. I have friends who uh, went to the north um, when they graduated for a year, and, and they're, they're still there. So, to, to to your point, I want to touch on the students because they're absolutely were impacted, certainly by shortages. But I agree with you. The pandemic. I can't begin to imagine how difficult it is for students to have lost those couple of years, especially the little ones. But I think all the way through. Um, and I agree, you know, the, the, the nurse said then me that the, the nutrition makes a difference and it makes a difference in someone's ability to just have attention, but also behaviors. But I also want to link on um, support, uh, the, the supports that, that certainly within government we're talking about around mental health and, and drug use and the role that teachers play in being able to detect when a child, and I understand it's an elementary often when a child begins to disengage and and that separation from focus and attention and then they become incredibly vulnerable to outside influences and, and becoming uh, part of uh, drug usage but it's very early when that happens so how can um, we support educators so that we work across departments and really together have eyes on young people to, to really assist in all ways to keep them focused and in a school system. So, yeah, I mean, you'll have to hold on to that because we're well over the time. So we, we've got it. Yeah, I'm even the second round. You can get to uh, to that answer. But uh, we are going now to MP St. Marie, please. Oui, merci, monsieur. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Greetings to all of the witnesses. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. NG, I really appreciated what you raised. There are certainly some amendments to support what you said in the clause by clause debate. Since my time is limited, my question is for the um, FCFA, FCAC rather. Where does the decision come to give you the responsibility for the open banking framework? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Government, through our, so the Minister of Finance and Department of Finance uh, chose us to be the regulator. Okay, merci beaucoup. Okay, thank you very much. We know that the sharing of financial data comes with great risks in terms of cybersecurity. What is the FCAC's expertise on the matter? Merci pour la... Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Currently, we don't ourselves have a lot of experience in cybersecurity, but certainly we will be developing that as part of our regulatory function and through the accreditation process. Uh, because right now, if there are any cybersecurity issues within the financial system, OSFI uh, plays a role in that, and we participate as a financial partner. Okay, merci beaucoup. Um, les entreprises. Okay, thank you very much. Financial technology companies are not banks, so they are not under federal jurisdiction. To your knowledge, did the government get the approval of the provinces and Quebec about their own uh, civil uh, civil legislation before tabling this bill? Merci pour la question. Thank you for the question. Uh, the currently under the framework, the uh, provincially regulated entities can opt in, so they're not subject to our own market conduct uh, activities. So that's why we're creating a completely new entity under the Senior Deputy Commissioner for Consumer Driven Banking to have that separation from our normal market conduct. They will still be under the jurisdiction of the provinces. But the very specific details with the provinces and the agreements are still being negotiated by the Department of Finance. Merci pour la réponse. Thank you for your answer. Obviously, here I was talking about financial technology companies, not financial institutions under provincial jurisdiction. But we had a briefing on on uh, the uh, means and ways. And what I understood from officials is that the financial institution under a provincial jurisdiction 
if it wishes to do open banking, must adhere to the federal framework. And to do so, the province needs to give its approval and to stop, to agree to stop regulating it on open banking. Is that your read of the situation as well? Merci pour la question. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, sorry, what I meant to say was the collaboration that is now taking place for the next stage of accreditation uh, is taking place with the provinces and the Department of Finance to identify the specific rules for all enterprises that are going to be engaging in the framework. So those, that collaboration is, is, and consultation uh, is commencing now. Merci pour uh, la, la question. Thank you for the clarity of your answer. So we understand the, f the federal government is c creating a federal uh, framework and the provinces and the consultations are starting now. It hasn't been done upstream and that is a huge problem. Are you able to tell us with the framework presented currently, which uh, provincial jurisdictions will have to cede way to the federal government? Merci pour la question, Monsieur. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. The, uh, the issue of the provincial federal relations are under the purview of the Department of Finance, so I would defer that question to them. Okay, merci. Êtes-vous en mesure? Okay, thank you. Are you able to tell me who will be responsible for the certification of technological companies? Will it be you at the federal level, or will it be the provincial regulators uh, like the Securities uh, Commission. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Specific issues of accreditation are still being finalized and the consultations are taking place with the provinces. But our expectation based on the current uh, framework that was published was that we would be the accreditation authority, uh, including those entities that opt in. Merci beaucoup. Uh, la loi québécoise sur la... Thank you very much. What about consumer protection in Quebec? Will it continue? Will it continue to apply to open banking activities? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Once again, that continues to be part of the ongoing uh, consultations that are taking place between the Department of Finance and the provinces, uh, so that those decisions haven't been made uh, available to us. Merci. Thank you. In the event of fraud or damages, will it be possible to launch a, a lawsuit under the uh, Consumer Protection of Quebec on under the Open Banking Framework? Uh, merci pour la question. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. And those details uh, of the policies and the legislation are under the purview of the Department of Finance. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Me reste, uh... Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do I have any time left? Uh, thank you, uh, MP Samari. And uh, now we will go to MP Davies for the next six minutes. Thank you. Professor, uh, is it LG or LG? LG, can you hear me? LG, thank you. Uh, Professor LG, um, what specific constitutional powers allow the federal government to regulate greenhouse gas emissions? Well, um, a number of different ones. The two main ones would be the, the power over matters of criminal law, and that's what underlies the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. So most of the climate regulations that have come in have been brought under the criminal law power, including back in the Harper years. Um, as of the 2021 decision on the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, the federal government also has some authority under the peace, order, and good government power of the Constitution, particularly, and that's the one that I'm speaking mainly to for this act, particularly, as the court said, to deal with serious cross-border pollution. Uh, that's, what, that's the main authority that arises under peace, order, and good government. And I would add that I've been speaking with a number of constitutional law professors and experts, and there's general agreement on that point. Thank you. Um, now, you wrote in an op-ed last October uh, the following. Over the past few days, the Alberta and Saskatchewan premiers and some Western leaders have gleefully declared that the Supreme Court of Canada's recent decision about the Federal Impact Assessment Act has curtailed federal power to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, the court did no such thing. Um, in your view, why are the Alberta and Saskatchewan premiers incorrect to suggest that that decision curtailed federal power to regulate greenhouse gas emissions? Well, I don't want to disagree with what I said in the op-ed. Um, I'll try to remember. Um, so 
Really, it goes to the two powers. So in terms of the criminal law power, which is the basis of most federal climate regulation, the court didn't deal with that power at all. In fact, it reiterated um, 30 years of constitutional jurisprudence underscoring the fact that the federal government has broad authority over the environment, particularly over cross-border matters. So that was the purpose of that op-ed, this is to say that the, the, the foundation of federal authority over climate and the environment in general is still strong. But as I said, the Supreme Court uh, two years ago reiterated it upheld the federal carbon pricing law and specifically said that the federal government has authority over serious pollution problems that cross borders. So really, all, all the court said in this act was that you've defined cross-border environmental pollution too broadly. You can't deal with just minimal problems or problems that are primarily local in nature. Uh, you have to deal with, as the court said, pollutions that are serious issues and have serious cross-border impacts. And, and so that's, that's what they've done for water. They just haven't done it for air pollution or climate change, which is surprising. Well, I was going to ask, if, if the federal government did not have the power to, to regulate in this area, um, let's say you had a project in one province that was contributing extensive cross-border pollution or greenhouse gas emissions, who would be able to regulate it if, if the federal government couldn't? Well, I mean, provinces are able to regulate emissions that occur in their province, but what they're unable to do is deal with impacts that occur outside their province. And similarly, if there's a, a large project in the U.S. So air generally flows west and north in Canada. So if you're in Quebec, northern Canada, the Maritimes, um, most of the pollution you're getting, or much of it, is coming from upstream. It's coming from the U.S. Midwest. It's coming from Ontario. Um, for, so it's well documented the phenomenon called the grasshopper effect, where persistent organic pollutants, toxins, make their way up to the Arctic. And you actually find toxic substances in the body tissues of people in the north that are higher than those in the south, because the air pollution generally moves, moves east, and moves north. So Quebec, the north, the Maritimes particularly are, are upwind and are affected by these problems. So they're unable to, to deal with the upwind or upstream causes of pollution. Pollution crosses borders. It doesn't stop. And, and so that's a core mm -hmm. role of the federal government, and it has been since the early 70s. The feds first passed the first Clean Air Act in 1971. Um, and so this is, this is an area they've occupied for over 50 years, and, um, and so we need them to continue to do so. Thank you. So if we get to the crux of the matter, it appears that in response to a Supreme Court decision, it looks like what the, the federal government has done is they have overreacted and, um, and they are too cautious in exercising this jurisdiction such that um, this legislation would not allow the federal government to regulate um, uh, cross-border greenhouse gas emissions. Is that in a, in a nub the, the, the issue we're dealing with here? gas emissions. That's right. That, that, that's the nub of the problem. Um, and to be fair, I mean, the federal government has brought in a number of strong climate laws uh, in the last seven years. It's actually got a pretty good track record. We've probably done more in the last seven years than we did in the previous 30. So there's a lot of good progress being made on tackling climate change and building a clean economy. But more needs to be done in this bill. This is the foundational bill that deals with major development projects and looks at the overall environmental impacts. And we're missing a really important piece of the puzzle when we do those assessments. If you're not looking at the air pollution, you're not looking at the climate impacts, it's like you know, missing an important part of a painting when you're staring at it. So in your view, how can that problem be addressed before still C-69 C is passed into law? Well, what I am we not an expert. I, I, I'm not an expert on how difficult it is to amend a Budget Implementation Act. I've never been involved in, in doing that before. Um, I would certainly say that it would be important to amend this, to fix this sooner rather than later, um, before uh, major projects go forward. Um, so I, I'm not, I'll leave it to the committee to decide what to do. Certainly, at the very least, it would be nice to see a very strong recommendation coming out of the committee, um, but I'm not an expert in uh, the challenges of amending a Budget Implementation Act. Yeah, I meant Thank more substantively. What, yeah, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll yeah, we, we, we've reached a time. We are going into our second round. We don't have a lot of time left. So what we're going to do is uh, provide two to maximum three minutes per uh, per party uh, to ask questions. And we're starting with uh, MP Chambers for the first two to three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Yetman, uh, you, the 
Teachers Federation launched a campaign to support a school food, food program in March. Uh, and I don't have a lot of time here, so just brief answers if you may. Um, were you made aware before the budget came down that that a school food program was going to be included in the budget? Uh, no, I wasn't. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the 2021 election, the Teachers Federation was a registered third party and spent about $33,000 on advertising during the election. Are you, do you recall uh, what those ads were in relation to? Uh, can you repeat the year? Uh, the 2021 federal election, the most recent federal election, about $33,000 was spent on oh. advertising during the election. Uh, I'm not aware of it. Uh, I wasn't president at that time. Um, I'd have to look into it. Okay. Um, uh, not necessary to look into it. Uh, do you anticipate that you'll be registered as a third party to advertise in the next federal election? Uh, at this moment, no. That's a decision that's made at the Board of Directors, and at this moment, we haven't uh, spoken about the election for 2025. Okay. Um, do you believe that it's appropriate for organizations to endorse political, thir like third parties, to endorse political, uh, political parties during a during an election? As far as I know, the Canadian Teachers Federation is nonpartisan. Uh, each member organization, however, across the country may endorse, but uh, generally speaking, teacher organizations do not, um, you know, lean to a party because they need to work, uh, you know, work with whoever's in power. And that's really important. I want to work with whoever's in power. And so uh, the Canadian Teachers Federation uh, does not uh, support any one, any one party. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your sentiments on that. Uh, I wish some of your uh, provincial bodies, uh, provincial bodies, felt the same way. But thank you for your testimony today. Thank you, uh, MP uh, Chambers, and now MP Baker for a couple of minutes. Oh, sorry, PS Turnbull for uh, for a couple of minutes. Thanks, uh, Ms. Edmund. Maybe just a quick question to you. Uh, I long advocated for a national school food program before getting into politics and, and during my time in politics. And I know that there's been uh, school food programs across the country. So it's not uncommon that there's already those programs in place, but that the federal commitment is going to significantly allow those programs to serve more children. Is that not correct? Absolutely. Um, I was the president of the Quebec Provincial Association of Teachers, so I can tell you in Quebec there was budgetary measures to uh, uh, feed children in schools in disadvantaged areas, but it was very limited, so we're hoping that provinces will take this money and, it, and you know, expand these programs and not take away from what's already there. That's really, really important. That's the work that has to be done. Uh, yeah, I was clarifying forward. because sometimes we hear the call that there's already programs. Why do you need more? Yeah. But those programs don't serve all kids across Canada. So having the federal investment is certainly going to amplify their capacity to serve more children. Uh, Mr. Elgi, I have limited time, so I'm going to go to you about the Impact Assessment Act. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. I appreciated your comments. Um, so my understanding is that Chief Justice Wagner, uh, not to be confused with the famous uh, German composer, uh, is um, talked about uh, cooperative federalism in his ruling and really put emphasis on uh, the federal government uh, and parliament working with uh, provincial jurisdictions. We've seen provincial jurisdictions pushing back, uh, you know, and challenging uh, the Impact Assessment Act, and I think at this point, um, clearly defining what is within federal um, jurisdiction and what is within provincial jurisdiction seems to be kind of the heart of. So I guess the federal government's approach right now, I think you're saying, is overly cautious. Do you think that's kind of merited, given the fact that there's an, uh, quite a number of projects in the pipeline and? there is a need for certainty and credibility and th that process kind of needs to continue. And uh, so I wanted to put that to you, whether you think that's kind of fair for the federal government to take a little bit more of a cautious approach uh, at this moment and then come back through provincial consultation and come back to perhaps adding, I think, 
what you're saying, which which I tend to agree with, that uh, air pollution and GHG emissions should be included in the Impact Assessment Act. But but do you think now is really the right time to do that when so many things hang in the balance? And with the Supreme Court decision that struck this down, it seems like we need to almost patch it up and, and get it underway again and then consider you know, with, with the right amount of consultation and engagement with provinces and territories to really come to terms with this once and for all so that we don't have this constant constitutional challenge problem when it comes to impact assessments. Okay, Sophia Kumba, we're well over the three minutes, uh, so just you, a quick... you, you've got like 10 seconds, and then if you want to elaborate in writing, you can send that to, uh, to the committee, please. Yeah. 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 Pretty much every federal environmental law gets challenged constitutionally. You can't avoid that. And everyone in the last 30 years has been upheld except for this one. Um, yes, I'm a big believer in cooperative federalism. We should try to collaborate on environmental assessment with provincial and indigenous governments as much as possible. Um, but not addressing international air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions is a big gap that provinces and territories can't address. So, yes, consultation, we should do it as soon as possible because uh, it's a gap until it gets fixed. Thank you. That was great. And uh, thank you, P.S. Turnbull. And now over to uh, MP Samari, please, for a couple of minutes. Merci, monsieur. Merci, monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For Mr. Elgi, the sharing, for Mr. Liedke, rather, there will be changes required to the prudential standards for financial institutions. What is your uh, expertise on the matter? Merci pour la question. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Financial matters fall under the jurisdiction of the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions. We focus on financial consumers. Merci. Thank you. In your opinion, do you think the authority for the uh, financial markets will need to change its rules to comply with the federal framework? Merci pour la Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I'm actually not sure of, of that, so I, I would expect it to be defined within the uh, policy. So we'll have to defer that question to the uh, Department of Finance because it's beyond the scope of, of FCAC and the financial consumer aspect. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. A last question. When will the federal, when did the federal government or the Department of Finance approach you to tell you that you would be responsible for the framework? Can you give us a date, please? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. It was announced on April 16th, and I was given a call on April 15th. Merci beaucoup. Ça complète. Thank you very much. That concludes my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. St. Marie. Final uh, questioner for this uh, second uh, panel today, uh, we, uh, which is our sixth panel of witnesses. Uh, we have MP Davies for a couple of minutes. Thank you. Professor LG. I'd like to pick up where I, I left off. And what I'm looking for is what is the specific substantive amendment that you would recommend that we need to make to Bill C-69 to correct the, uh, the, the issue before us of this retreat, apparently, from uh, federal uh, jurisdiction over cross-border pollution? Well, I think if, if the, the, probably the most important one is just to say the same thing for air pollution that the bill now says for water pollution, that a, a significant air pollution that crosses national or provincial borders should be subject to federal environmental assessment. Um, you could, there are other things that could be added onto that. Um, I would do that, obviously, in a way that respects cooperative federalism. Uh, if provinces are adequately addressing the matter, then the federal government could step back, as it does with most environmental laws. But it needs to have that, that power in the act uh, sooner rather than later, I would say. Thank you. Um, Ms. Yetman, um, a study published uh, by the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario found that students with increased food insecurity were more likely to have decreased test scores and, and consequently lower rates of enrollment in post-secondary education. Um, other studies have shown food insecurity, uh, students facing food insecurity were um, less likely to meet grade level expectations for reading and similarly for mathematics. Um, how will the rollout of the National School Lunch Program impact students' educational attainments in your view and experience? I think it will be a huge impact on students. Um, everybody's sitting around this table when you get hungry, can you concentrate as well? 
Um, and we know that teachers, they know when kids haven't eaten in the classroom. They often have drawers filled with uh, granola bars and apples, etc. Uh, you can't concentrate when your stomach is empty. And so this gives, and there's tons of research that shows that it's the great equalizer. So even for kids that, um, you know, the kids that are in low income areas will do much, much better if they have a meal every day. And there's lots of studies. There was a study somewhere, and I, I wish I could remember where it was either Sweden or somewhere like that, where they did a longitudinal study. And actually, the average size of children grew as well. So that's incredible. It's not only, uh, you know, um, mental health, but physical health. And moving forward, also knowing about what good what good foods are, and um, I think it's really really important. It's going to make a make a big big difference in the classroom, and especially right now, like I said before, uh, classrooms are more and more difficult. So um, children that are sitting in the class without food, they're not concentrating and they're having a hard time. I think it's just going to make things a lot easier for everybody. Thank you, uh, MP Davies, and uh, on, on that we want to thank our excellent uh, group of uh, witnesses. Thanks for your testimony, for the information that you have provided here to our committee uh, for C69, and we do wish you the best with the rest of, uh, of your day. At this time, members, we are going to uh, suspend as we transition to our next panel. Thank you. back and uh, this is our uh, third panel of witnesses today although it is our seventh panel of witnesses on uh, C69 and uh, with us uh, for this panel we have the Canadian Council for Refugees uh, its vice president Jenny Jeans is with us as well as the co-executive director Gari Srinivasan uh, as is also joining us, and from the Canadian Physiotherapy Association, the Senior Director of Advocacy, Kayla Scott, uh, will be joining us. And from Fintechs Canada, the Executive Director, Alexander Vrance. I don't know if that's French or English, but Vrance. Uh, so we will uh, first hear from the Canadian Council for Refugees. I understand you'll be uh, sharing your time uh, for... Uh, for Jenny Jeans and uh, Gari Srinivasan, although Gari, I believe you are first, yes? Okay, you, you may commence. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair. Thank you very much for the opportunity to appear. The Canadian Council for Refugees is Canada's leading national umbrella, representing over 200 frontline organizations working with, from, and for refugees and migrants. On apprécie beaucoup l'opportunité. We really appreciate the opportunity to present our thoughts and recommendations to the committee concerning the Budget at, uh, Implementation Act. 2024 had important investments to support refugee claimants, but the Budget Implementation Act is now suggesting major new changes to refugee and immigration law that are extremely concerning without prior consultation, and that include changes that will not only undermine international human rights, but our reputation as a rules-based refugee leader. The CCR objects to the Budget Implementation Act being used in this undemocratic way to bring in potentially sweeping changes to the refugee system. As you will see in our brief, our overarching recommendation is for you to either delete major sections of the bill or for you to insist on the immigration and refugee aspects being separated out from the legislation to enable full hearings and debate and further parliamentary review of pending regulations which have yet to be tabled. Lives are at stake. We have four major concerns. I'm going to cover two regarding changes to the refugee claims process, and CCR Vice President Jenny Jeans will cover the other two aspects related to CBSA and detention. 
It's worth remem remembering, members of Parliament, that Canada has an obligation under international law to provide safe haven to those who arrive at our shores fleeing persecution. And the vast majority of those who seek asylum in Canada, almost 80% last year, are found to be refugees. We have a world-class refugee determination system to hear cases at the Immigration and Refugee Board. We need to let them do their job. But Bill C-69 is making major changes. First, Division 38 is creating a worrisome new step in the refugee claim process that creates an indefinite gap before referral to the Immigration Refugee Board, the IRB, in which claimants can be asked to provide endless information and documents with no timeline for the claim to be referred for their hearing. It will lead to long delays, creating indefinite limbo for claimants, threatening not only fundamental rights, but undermining, ironically, progress made to date in streamlining processing. CCR is recommending to the committee to amend sections 410 and 411 to delete the provisions whereby if a claim is determined to be eligible, the minister must consider it further to enable discretion in that case and to amend section 411 so that an eligible claim must be referred to the IRB at least within a month of required information being submitted. These are crucial amendments to, to secure due process. Our second concern is that Division 38 introduces new provisions that trigger an early opportunity for a claim to be declared abandoned before it has even been referred to the IRB. The measure is likely to lead to claims being unfairly declared abandoned, penalizing people who, through no fault of their own, miss a deadline or forget to file a document in a Byzantine system that is already providing zero formal support services. Those most at risk are likely to be the most vulnerable. The provision will also, again, counterintuitively contribute to a backlog of abandonment hearings at the IRB. The measures are absurd to be rammed through now. They need to be rethought. We are recommending MPs move to delete Section 412 or at least in the alternative to change Section 102.1 to from the minister must to the minister may to allow situations where claimants are obviously trying to complete requirements but are prevented due to lack of counsel. It's only common sense. I want to turn it over to CCR's Vice President now to continue with our presentation. Thank you very much. Um, as well as being Vice President, I'm also the Detention Program Coordinator at Exer Refugee Montréal. A major preoccupation with the bill is the creation of immigration stations. It's deeply disturbing that the government is proposing to expand places of detention on immigration grounds to federal correctional facilities when all 10 provinces have clearly expressed a rejection of the practice of immigration detention in jails. Creating a new possibility to detain in federal jails is a step in the wrong direction. We should avoid detention and release through expanded alternatives to detention. Many of those considered high risk have mental health and addiction issues. Investments should go towards proper supports. If people are detained, CBSA can and should manage risk itself with appropriate uh, independent oversight. Imprisoning detained individuals in jails is punitive and does not respect fundamental rights. There's a risk of geographic isolation. Also, for those seeking protection, being detained in jail is re-traumatizing and jeopardizes the chances of their claim being accepted. Our understanding is that a scan of federal facilities has not been completed. If individuals are detained in federal jails, there's a high risk that they would be in de facto solitary confinement, potentially for long periods of time. Our recommendation is to delete the provisions 433 to 441 that would enable the use of federal correctional facilities for immigration detention. Well, thank you very much for those uh, those opening remarks. And now we're going to hear from the Canadian Physiotherapy Association. Uh, Kayla Scott, please. Thank you, Chair. And thank you to the esteemed members of this committee for having me here today. My name is Kayla Scott, and I'm the Senior Director of Advocacy at the Canadian Physiotherapy Association. Our association proudly represents over 16,000 physiotherapy professionals and students across Canada. Our members embody our mission to enhance health, mobility, rehabilitative care, and treatment to enable Canadians to live well and actively in their communities. Physiotherapy professionals demonstrate unwavering commitment to their patients and their communities and have a pivotal role in our healthcare system, providing invaluable services across diverse settings. In emergency departments and select provinces, they offer critical care, ensuring timely and effective treatment for acute conditions. 
Their expertise allows them to rapidly assess and treat patients, reducing wait times and alleviating pressure on our healthcare system. Their interventions can often be the difference between recovery and long-term complications, underlining the importance of their work. In long-term care facilities, physiotherapy professionals deliver essential rehabilitation therapy as part of their home care services. They create personalized care plans to improve residents' mobility, strength, and overall well-being. This approach not only helps physical recovery and injury prevention, but also strengthens mental and emotional health, promoting patient autonomy, positivity, and resilience. Additionally, physiotherapy professionals play a crucial role in prenatal care, offering specialized pelvic floor physiotherapy for expectant parents. This service supports prenatal health, prepares parents for childbirth, and promotes postnatal recovery. The role of physiotherapy professionals in this area is often overlooked. Yet, it is an essential in ensuring the health and well-being of both the parent and child. Today, I stand before you to express my gratitude for the recently announced expansion of the Canada Student Financial Assistance Program in Budget 2024. This expansion, which now encompasses physiotherapists working in underserved rural and remote communities, marks a significant step towards achieving healthcare equity and alleviating pressures from our healthcare system across Canada. This pivotal decision announced in Budget 2024 is the result of CPA's persistent advocacy and pre-budget recommendations and the unified voices of physiotherapy professionals and students. It represents a major achievement for all Canadians, especially those seeking equitable care in rural and remote areas. The expansion of the CSFA program will yield a threefold benefit. First, it will attract more Canadians to the physiotherapy profession by reducing the financial barriers to education. With the average student debt for physiotherapy students standing at $40,000, this assistance will provide significant relief, making the profession more accessible to a broader range of individuals. Second, it will increase health service access and delivery in communities that face the barrier of long travel times to access care. By encouraging more physiotherapists to serve in these areas, we can ensure that every Canadian, regardless of their location, has access to high quality health care. Lastly, it will enhance the recruitment of students from rural communities and help promote a workforce that includes students from underrepresented populations. Our partners in health echo our sentiments. The Canadian Nurses Association applauded this expansion as it supports team-based care, enabling diverse healthcare professionals to collaborate <coughs> and provide comprehensive patient-centered services. The Canadian Orthopedic Association also firmly supported this inclusion recognizing its potential patient recovery and strengthen our healthcare system at its core. As National Physiotherapy Month ends today, we are firm in our commitment to build on this momentum. We will continue to advocate for policy changes that allow the profession to fully exercise their expertise through the optimization of scope of practice across the country, enabling them to provide high quality care at their optimal potential. Our unwavering mission remains to ensure that every Canadian, irrespective of their location, has access to the quality of care that they deserve. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Scott. And uh, now we'll hear from uh, Fintechs Canada, Mr. Vrancis. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon to the Chair, Vice Chair, uh, members of the Standing Committee on Finance. Uh, my name is Alex and I'm the Executive Director of Fintechs Canada. Uh, Fintechs Canada is an industry association of Canada's most innovative financial technology companies. Our members collectively serve millions of Canadians on a daily basis. Uh, economic growth has slowed. Life is increasingly unaffordable. Canadian productivity has reached emergency status. At Fintechs Canada, we believe in whole-of-government solutions to problems like this one. 
One critical part of the solution needs to be boosting competition in banking because our banking sector is partly to blame for the problem. That means passing the bits and pieces of an open banking framework we're starting to see in Bill C-69 without delay. More competition in banking will make life more affordable for Canadians. Canada's banking sector is heavily concentrated with little change over the past decade. Canadians pay higher banking fees than consumers in similar markets, such as the United Kingdom's and Australia's. Canada's big banks make more and more of their money from what's called non-interest income, or in other words, fees. These include account and investment management fees, payment processing fees, and administrative fees on mortgages and other loans. More competition in banking will also boost Canada's productivity. Canada's economy is mostly made up of small businesses, but Canada's small businesses receive less financing from our banks and pay more for it than their peers in other countries. Weak investment in Canada's small business community is a long-standing issue. How can our economy run at its best when the engine has no fuel to run on? Consumer-driven banking will help boost competition in banking by putting consumers in control of their financial information. Suppose you're a recent immigrant who can't qualify for a loan because you don't have a Canadian credit history. With open banking, you can reliably and securely share your monthly rent pay payments with Borwell's Rent Advantage app to build your credit score. Or maybe you're a small business who doesn't want to rely on spreadsheets to manage your books. You can use open banking to reliably and securely share your transaction data with accounting platforms like Xero to automate your bookkeeping. If you're having trouble tracking investment accounts at different banks, there are apps that let you view and manage them in a single dashboard. But to share your data securely and reliably, you need open banking. By empowering Canadians to reliably and securely share their financial information, Canadians will be better able to vote with their wallets. They can decide for themselves who will serve them best. What's more, Canadians can do this without having to decipher who's the most secure and resilient because of the consumer protection that comes with open banking. As I've written before, open banking isn't really about opening the vault of financial data. That much has already happened. It's actually about closing it again and putting Canadians in charge, letting Canadians decide whom it can be opened for, when it can be opened, how long it can be opened, and for what purpose. This is why Canada needs the Consumer Driven Banking Act. It also needs a regulator, such as the FCAC, well equipped for the job of policing the industry. The longer we wait, the further and further it will fall behind our G7 counterparts who have already put their financial sectors to work to make their economies more competitive, affordable, and productive. Dr. Francis, I'm just going to interject if you could just speak a little bit uh, slower just so our interpretation services can capture everything that you're saying and be able to do their, their job. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you for your uh, invitation to appear. I look forward to answering any questions. <laughs> Sorry. Well, that was a good pace at the end. And uh, yeah, and, uh, but uh, as we get into questions, maybe the same. Yeah, just if you can adhere to the same thing. So, OK, great. Um, we are on our questions now. And uh, so the first round, we will have six minutes uh, for each party to ask questions of the witnesses. And we're starting uh, with Mr. Williams, MP Williams, for the first six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And once again, a pleasure to be part of the Finance Committee. Uh, Alex, thank you for joining us here today and, and uh, happy to have you uh, talk about the benefits of open banking. Uh, can you tell us, as Canada provided uh, a good timeline for when open banking will be implemented, and are you happy with the progress of the Government of Canada so far? So it's, it's no secret that the sector is uh, disappointed and frustrated. Um, there have been numerous delays. Uh, we've been really slow out the gate. Uh, open banking or consumer-led banking or consumer-driven banking, whichever term you'd like to use, was first mentioned in a 2018 budget. I oh, believe, and since then, we, we've really studied the question to death while other countries have acted. Um, uh, this many years into the process, we're, 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 we're just starting to see an open banking framework come to fruition. In other jurisdictions, um, it took no more than a few years for the government to go from stating its intention to actually delivering, to actually having a system uh, up and running for their citizens uh, to benefit from. We had uh, FCAC uh, in, the, in the last round, so they talked about they're, they're selected as a regulator. Um, they've been uh, normally tasked with, with handling consumer relations, so uh, now they, they need to handle business to business as well. Are you confident uh, that they can handle the task and, and, and be the regulator? Regardless of which regulator was picked, I think there would have been challenges. When it comes to business, business to business transactions, I think there are 
two issues um, uh, that could emerge. Um, uh, you know, what, one is can small business owners share the data that they should be in control of? I think the Consumer Driven Banking Act, as it's outlined today, allows for that. Section three um, makes it very clear that 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 small businesses are supposed to be in scope. They're explicitly mentioned. Um, when it comes to policing um, disputes between businesses, however, the the FCAC may be less equipped if the businesses we're talking about are uh, banks and fintechs. Um, one of the reasons we need government intervention uh, to implement an open banking framework is because the market hasn't been able to work it out itself. The market hasn't been able to get along. So you can imagine a world where going forward, there are disputes that arise between banks and fintechs. Um, uh, I think our, our, our view is we, we should keep our um, consumer protection watchdog in the financial sector a consumer protection watchdog and not a- add to its mandate. For open banking to be successful, the job of the FCAC shouldn't be to protect fintechs from banks. It shouldn't be to protect banks from fintechs. It should be to protect and empower Canadians uh, first and foremost. Uh, Absolutely agree. And um, would you support an amendment on data to ensure that it includes small business in the terminology in in terms of of how we're talking about uh, data and services that it should include small business as well and not just consumer? So I'm not a professional drafter. Uh, so when it comes to the text, text, text of uh, legislation, I'll have to defer to others. But my read of the act and in my conversations with with department officials, it's been made clear to me that small business accounts are in scope. Um, small business accounts are explicitly referenced in Section Three of the Consumer Driven Banking Act, and um, uh, in my conversations with department officials, uh, they clarified it's like this so that we can be clear that 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 when this system launches, it won't just be consumer accounts, small business accounts uh, will be um, in scope as well. Something I asked FCAC was about the AMPs. So the administrative monetary penalties, uh, the maximum penalties already listed up to 10 million, which is more than, than a lot of the revenue for some fintechs. Wondering if it's premature if we don't have the legislation in front of, uh, of parliament at this time to have the amps, or what, what are your feelings on, on some of those penalties? Great question. Uh, you know, if I'm running a business and I see the amps, uh, you know, my my heart might start beating quick, quickly for just a second. But I say just a second because I think r- really the only businesses that 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 should fear the amps right now are ones who are worried about their ability to um, uh, uh, handle the data of Canadians with care. Um, uh, I don't think our regulators have a history of, of um, uh, administering monetary penalties willy-nilly. In fact, I've heard some arguments to the contrary. I've, I've heard consumer groups say our FCAC isn't aggressive enough. Um, uh, uh, perhaps this isn't a, a, a popular thing to say, but, but you know, the, the, um, the only real loud opposition I, I've heard uh, about the AMPS I- in my conversations with the fintech scene is, is um, from, from companies that have already been on the receiving end of an FCAC penalty. Our members are comfortable um, with the AMPS as is because our members um, realize they're operating in a very special space, the financial sector, and they need Canadians' trust. Um, they have no doubt in their ability to comply with the framework that's coming. Okay. Uh, CEBR has, uh, has noted that the... Uh, the delay of, of payments and instant payments is, is causing 2.7% uh, lack of growth to G- GDP, which is 500 million a year. When do we need all of this implemented? Is, is, do we need this tomorrow? Uh, when, is, when really do we want all of this implemented in order to benefit uh, Canadians and, and to, to your opening point to uh, boost productivity? Ideally, it would have been implemented um, a few years ago. I mean, when it comes to instant payments. Uh, the project uh, has been delayed several times over the past decade. Uh, the RTR was first announced